So I'm releasing this film about the vaccine claims made on the Dark Horse podcast by Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying and their guests, along with two long written articles. One in the online magazine Aereo, and another really long one going through the evidence as best as I can on our Rebel Wisdom Medium page. I'll put the links in the show notes below. I'm also releasing a film at the same time with Iona Italia, the editor of Aereo, about the process we've gone through around this topic, which has genuinely been the hardest thing I've dealt with during my time making films for Rebel Wisdom, given the friendship I have for Brett and Heather and the fact that we've done events with them in the past. As many of you watching will be aware, over the last couple of months, Brett Weinstein and his guests have been making a lot of claims about ivermectin and vaccines on the Dark Horse podcast, and he's been heavily criticised by people including Brett's friend Sam Harris and his former guest Yuri Dagin, who we also put out an interview with. And all these issues have been caught up in the ongoing battle around censorship and free speech after YouTube took down some of the films from the Dark Horse podcast. Brett was then featured on Joe Rogan, Lex Friedman, Megyn Kelly, Tucker Carlson. So this is really high profile stuff about really important topics. So mine and Rebel Wisdom's central concern all the way through has been the problem of sense making. On one side, as Brett and Heather talk about how institutional forces can suppress alternative narratives, capture. And also on the other side, how the platforms we're on and the tools we're using can warp the world around us and trap us in echo chambers. Because the central problem is that we're lost in an uncanny valley between a mainstream that won't platform alternative voices for fear of giving them false equivalents, and an alternative media that isn't even trying to scrutinise the claims of their guests or to cover all perspectives. I started covering these topics on Rebel Wisdom a few weeks ago after they got really close to home. Rebel Wisdom shares about a third of our subscribers with The Dark Horse, and these are hugely consequential claims. On one side, people believe that questioning the vaccines is literally killing people. And on the other side, people believe they're being forced to take novel and unproven treatments by a medical and government establishment that's proved to be untrustworthy in so many ways. This is arguably the hardest sense-making task there is right now, with everyone getting emotional and losing their ground, which I'm as guilty of as anyone if you follow me on Twitter. But I have been trying to deal with these claims and counterclaims in as balanced a way as I can, to offer a place to stand that isn't part of an echo chamber, which is why recently we put out the film Ivermectin For and Against, which showed both sides of the argument. YouTube took it down, but then put it back up again on appeal. I was considering doing the same for the claims around the vaccine, and for some time now I've been asking many of Brett's guests, Robert Malone, Steve Kirsch, Geert van den Bosch, to come on and have a dialogue, ideally with critics, so people can make up their own minds for themselves. However, they either didn't reply or didn't want to. And over time, while investigating the topic, I became increasingly concerned that a lot of what was being claimed just didn't really add up, and that also made me less keen to host them. The articles I'm releasing today explain my thinking and the best evidence that I've been able to pull together over the last few weeks. The focus that everyone has on the dynamic between censorship and free speech and the big tech platforms obscures what I think is the biggest issue, which are the individual moral decisions of content creators. Who are we inviting on and why? How are we doing those interviews? And in the alternative media landscape, we're all making it up as we go along. I've got a background with Channel 4 News and the BBC, so I have a set of expectations and principles that many don't have and maybe aren't appropriate for alternative media. I genuinely don't know. However, I do believe that there are some moral principles. This should be about all of us pursuing truth as best we can. But Rebel Wisdom and Brett and Heather with The Dark Horse are trying to do something incredibly difficult, to do sense-making outside of the institutions. We don't have anything like the resources of a media company, so it's not surprising that we'll get things wrong. The documents I've pulled together are literally just me and a researcher working two days a week, and Brett and Heather are in a similar situation. In this film, I'm going to go through just a few of the claims made on the Dark Horse podcast and some of the evidence I've been able to pull together. I'm also going to play some clips from different interviews, including the one with Iona about why we decided to put out this article and what a difficult process it was. As I mentioned before, like th these are incredibly difficult 
topics. I personally have tried to to kind of act as ethically as I can. Like the article that's just been published, I sent it to Brett, or I sent a version of it to Brett about a week ago um, to to get his opinion, to see get his response. I've been in contact with Brett quite a bit behind the scenes. Um, this is something I haven't done lightly. Um, and I know that when we talked, also you had an element of feeling conflicted as well. Um, is is that is that fair? How would you how would you um, summarize kind of what, why did he decide to publish it, and what are the factors that you're kind of bearing in mind? I don't know Brett well, but he and Heather have been largely supportive towards Ario. So Heather is actually a patron, and she's also written several pieces for Ario. And I absolutely love her writing. Mm. And the most difficult part has been this sense of balancing my obligations to them as friends uh, and, and, and the wider obligations to truth seeking and to making sense of the landscape and then expressing what I believe to be true. There really aren't any rules to this. This is something I think completely new. When, when there are institutions, there were sort of institutional rules. And I still have some of those, like right of reply is quite a big one in, in journalism. If you're going to say something about someone, you should put their put the points to them before publication. That's something that's largely lost, I think, in the independent landscape, where the idea is you put something out and then people can do a counterpoint if they want, their own video, and then it sort of becomes a back and forth, maybe. So this is not going to feature any interviews with the Dark Horse guests, but I will play a couple of clips. And I've tried to deal as completely as possible with their claims and the claims made by Brett and Heather in the Medium article. I'm also trying to make that a new form of journalism. I'll correct it if needed and update it with more information if it comes in. Of course, we're all biased. I have my biases and I've tried to put those aside while making these films. However, we're also ethical and moral beings. I began Rebel Wisdom with a series of films on Jordan Peterson and I take to heart that we have to speak the truth as best we can, no matter what the results. These claims around vaccines are incredibly heated and polarizing, breaking friendships, straining family ties. On one side, people believe that others' decision not to get vaccinated is putting people at risk. And on the other, people believe they're being compelled to take new and unproven treatments against their will. I personally have friends whose parents have had serious adverse reactions soon after having the vaccines. I don't know whether they were related, but I also know many people whose relatives died of COVID and several guys my own age who suffered debilitating long COVID. People have to decide for themselves whether or not to get vaccinated. I simply want people to be making decisions based on the best possible evidence and accurate assessments of the risks and rewards, something that is hard to come by due to the nature of the echo chambers we've created for ourselves. My views are when it comes to vaccine safety, people are understandably concerned about novel vaccines created quickly during a pandemic. Some are trying to understand the evidence on either side, and there are also a hardcore of people who are reactive contrarians or long-term anti-vaccine activists looking for proof that the vaccines are dangerous and they're being lied to by the authorities. And real thinking and following the evidence can take you to the consensus position just as easily as it can take you to a contrarian position, as Eric Weinstein said in our recent film. I think I very often call it reflexive contrarianism, where the idea is that um a bad contrarian attempts to put a minus sign in front of whatever it was that was said by the mainstream and hopes that that's right because the mainstream is always wrong. Um, that doesn't work for, uh, I mean, myriad reasons. But um, in particular, one thing is it means you're under the control of the mainstream because you're reflexively simply negating them at all times. And uh, very often the most actually heterodox and uh, difficult thing for somebody who's in that space is to say, uh, I actually think that the mainstream is correct about something. They may have gotten there through means that I don't approve of. So how do I make sense of things? I'm a curator, a journalist, mostly an interviewer. So I find the people I think have worthwhile things to say and ask them questions. I'm not a public intellectual and rarely do I do this epistemic authority thing, speaking direct to camera like I mean it. But I am lucky enough to have interviewed some pretty amazing people at the top of the game of sense making, like Daniel Schmachtenberger. Let's say we take people's fervent ideas on uh, vaccines or their fervent ideas on 
um, the viability of market ideology or almost anything like that. Um, almost no one who has fervent ideas has a good epistemic basis for the level of certainty they hold. There's a decoupling between how much certainty they have and how much certainty they should have through right process. And then you look at who are they proxying their sense making to, and most of the time they're not even proxying their sense making to the people who did the original research, m many of whom disagree with each other. And yet there's an almost religious fervor around it that was based on having proxied their sense making to people who they believe. So as a journalist, I try to make sense of things in context, find the right people to speak to and piece things together. With these topics, vaccines and ivermectin, I've tried to find medical voices who are anti-consensus, who share the concerns about Big Pharma and the institutions. I've spoken to quite a lot behind the scenes, and I've pieced the story together as best as I can. I trust the doctors more who don't say, all vaccines are totally safe, but instead say, you know what, I was worried about the vaccines when they came out because they were produced so quickly, and a lot of the other medical staff in my hospital were too, but I've been persuaded over time by what I've seen and what other doctors tell me. And I work in a huge hospital, and if there were massive numbers of people dying, I'd be seeing that. That for me is much more convincing than just trust the authorities. These are the factors that I'm weighing up. Firstly, vaccines are at this really weird intersection of science, medicine, and public health. And these things do not go together. Science is about examining things as carefully as possible with no agenda. Public health is all about agenda. It's identifying one single course of action and trying to make everyone follow it. The pandemic has shown up a lot of things. Firstly, the decline of our institutions and how the people in charge of many of them feel comfortable lying to us rather than having complex, honest and nuanced conversations. Like saying, instead of masks don't work, Masks do work, but we need them for healthcare workers, so please don't buy them all up. The lab leak hypothesis was probably the biggest one, which even though we still don't know for sure where the virus came from, we do know how the narrative was constructed to demonize a conspiracy theorist, anyone who thought it could possibly have come from um, the main bat coronavirus research center in the world where they were experimenting with viruses in uh, Wuhan. As we told in our lab leak film, that was a deliberate strategy by a small group of influential scientists working with the authorities to frame the narrative. Probably because even if it wasn't a leak, they didn't want people to realize just how dangerous a lot of their work had been. And this narrative held up for over a year until it fell apart in May, which led a lot of people to wonder, what else could they be lying to us about? In my view, the narrative that fuels a lot of this is the noble lie that all vaccines are completely safe and anyone who thinks different is a rabid anti-vaxxer. When a more accurate statement would be vaccines are medical interventions and like any medical intervention, there are risks and rewards. However, the majority believe that the risk is vastly outweighed by the reward of not getting COVID. In the gap between this official noble lie and the truth is the fertile ground where conspiratorial thinking takes root. I think that the claim that vaccines are safe is the, you know, vaccines are safe is the three line thing that you do when you, when you're really trying to say something like vaccines aren't perfectly safe. They do have negative side effects. Maybe they have far more than we've ever thought, but that on balance vaccines for a population are safe and we have to spread the risk. So you're taking a risk and we expect you to do it just the way we expect you to be conscribed into an army when there's a war. It's not very comfortable, but we don't have a culture of adult communication to the public. So we say things like vaccines are safe, no lockdowns anymore, vax it or mask it. You know, it's basically sing song rhymes from kindergarten. But I think it's time to be honest about the full story, not just half of it. That yes, we should all be aware and concerned of the warping effects of big pharma and the authorities on the narrative of capture now, what do you do in a case where you have rampant corruption? And I do think one of the things that is afflicting people's um, comprehension of what's taking place here is that many people who have not been inside academia or conversely are so deeply enmeshed in it that they are dependent on it are incapable of seeing that the same corruption that has rendered our governmental structures so thoroughly broken so that they do the bidding of others instead of the bidding of the public, that same thing is true 
inside of academia more subtly. It makes its way into papers, it makes its way into analyses, it makes its way into the advice that we get from many people who are involved in that structure, but you can't see it. And if it hasn't been your home, you don't recognize it. So do I believe that a major cover-up, the kind of capture that Brett and Heather are talking about, could be true? In short, yes. I researched a story for months for a possible documentary about the over-prescription of and damage done by psychiatric drugs, what's called iatrogenic harm which is the story told by the Pulitzer-nominated journalist Robert Whittaker in his amazing book, Anatomy of an Epidemic. The people who prescribe drugs don't want to admit that their drugs are doing harm. They only want to see them through a prism of doing help. Even though we all know that drugs can do harm, that's not how the prescriber or the, uh, you know, the medical profession of psychiatry wants to see its drugs. So what they do is, is they start saying that... Um, uh, people are treatment resistant or you know it's the illness that is is what you're seeing now is the illness return and once that happens what happens you go on a second drug you go on a third drug you go on a fourth drug it's a story that the medical establishment doesn't want to hear and people who've tried to raise the alarm like professor david healy found themselves under attack their careers stalled denied places at universities it's a story that's hard to report, it's complex, and you can be accused of, are you telling people to stop taking their medication? No, it's a complicated story and you should watch the film with Robert Whittaker to see more. The real story is that the brain and the body are a complex system and adapt to the drugs. Many of the drugs work in the short term, but the chemical imbalance story that's told by mainstream medicine is wrong, and it's dangerously wrong. And the long-term effects are not so positive. So as I say, don't stop taking the drugs, but do watch the full film with Robert for a fuller picture. So yes, capture happens. But does it explain what's going on right now with the dark horse, the claims and counterclaims? I don't think so. One example, why are Brett and Heather so far out on their own in making these claims? Even with the lab leak hypothesis, there were multiple journalists and credible figures making the argument from early in the pandemic, like Matt Ridley, Jamie Metzl, Josh Rogan, Nicholson Baker, Ian Birrell, and many others. On the psychiatric drug story, it's not just Robert Whittaker, it's James Davies, Johan Hari, Joanna Moncrief, even the top medical scientist, Peter Gotcher, who co-founded the medical gold standard Cochrane collaboration, and a host more. Either Brett and Heather really are the only people brave enough to follow the evidence on vaccines, or others have looked at it, like me, for example, and concluded that a lot of what they're saying and a lot of what their guests are saying is just wrong. The trouble with conspiratorial thinking is always the last 10%. The first 90%, why we shouldn't trust the authorities, is generally right. Then you've got to watch for the point where the skepticism of mainstream narratives is replaced with certainty on the other side. As well as an awareness of the corrupting power of the consensus, we also need to be aware of the attraction of the counter-narrative. The story of rebel doctors sticking it to the man, of heroic fights against censorship and the big tech platforms. These are also compelling narratives to be swept up in, and neither of them have anything to do with real truth-seeking. And we're going to have to confront the fact that our audiences want us to do things that are not safe, not good, because of the fact that they want a shelling point which either says the man is right or the man is trying to stick it to us. And neither of these shelling points is viable. Congratulations, you've, you've, entered, you've entered the wilderness of modernity, now the argument that only stupid people are questioning the vaccines is clearly wrong. Most of the arguments about spike proteins, mRNA technology, data analysis of ivermectin use are really complex. It's not just stupid people being manipulated. And all of this is happening in a much wider context. As Eric said in our recent film, it happens downstream of the decline of many of our institutions. I think there is no concept of leadership at all I don't think in the era in which we live, we have seen someone behave as a leader. And Eric's right, but it's not the full story. The world is too complex for us to make sense of independently. We used to be able to rely on the institutions, and now many of us feel that we can't. But like G.K. Chesterton said about religion, when a man stops believing in God, he'll believe in anything. And when we stop believing in the institutions, we don't stop believing. We have to trust something. We have to proxy our sense-making to something. 
We find other sources of information on the internet, prominent public figures, YouTubers even. I know Brett and Heather to be decent, ethical people, deeply concerned about others. But as I've been looking into this, I believe they've got lost. As we all can in this alternative media landscape, what we've recently called the uncanny valley of truth-seeking in our newsletter. But it's not just them, it's the people they're influencing. Brett and Heather have a huge amount of hard-won credibility from their history at Evergreen standing up to a woke mob, their background as scientists, and their careful analysis of the evidence on so many other topics. And in my view, that influence comes with responsibility. If you're in a position like we are in, do you talk about what you see or do you keep quiet so as not to be blamed, right? Now, my feeling is we are morally required to the extent that we believe we can see something that is failing about the public health analysis. We are morally required to engage in talking about this. You are not required to listen. You are certainly not required to extrapolate from anything that we say on this podcast and adjust your behavior. You can just listen into a discussion. Imagine it's a seminar taking place in which we are talking about whether or not the public health analysis makes any sense. Now, if you find yourself persuaded by something that we say, it may indeed affect your behavior, but that's because you have been persuaded. We don't have the power to dictate any policy. Nobody has to follow what we're saying. Nobody has to listen in. So people are choosing to listen in. They are rightly frightened by the fact that the advice they are getting from public health officials doesn't add up, not even superficially. And so I would just simply ask, it is not the case that we are putting people's lives at risk. It is the case that lives are at stake in the COVID pandemic and that it is true that lives will be lost if we do the wrong things and not the right things. The question is, what are the right things and how would you know? Things took a darker turn this week when a British man, Leslie Lawrenson, died of COVID after he videoed himself saying he was glad he got the virus because he didn't trust the vaccines. People get flu, people get colds, people, endure it and then get on with their lives. That's the way it's always been. COVID-19, in my view, um, and from what I've experienced so far, is nothing different, nothing different. Then, but the dangers of, potential dangers from taking the experimental jab, for me, are not worth that risk. And it then turned out that he had been sharing content from the Dark Horse. To be clear, Lawrenson said that COVID wasn't that dangerous. And as Brett says, he and Heather have been very clear since the beginning that it is a very dangerous illness. They believe they have a moral imperative to speak out because they believe the vaccines also have dangers that are not being reported. And they take this responsibility very seriously, as Brett told Megan Kelly. It is a sobering fact that when one speaks about this issue, it will very likely persuade people to change their decision about things like vaccines. That's not a responsibility I want, but it's one that I feel I have to take on because the, the analysis that matters is the net analysis. What is the best policy from the point of view of reducing the number of people lost to this disease and lost to adverse reactions to vaccines? The central problem for me is that in all their time covering COVID, and especially since making their claims about vaccines, Brett and Heather haven't hosted anyone who disagrees, and they've chosen to interview fringe people from vaccine skeptical circles without challenging them, and in doing so have lent them their credibility and their audience. Brett's argument is that the dark horse provides a counterpoint to the mainstream. But the issue is, this isn't how the internet works, and it's not how people work. If you create a podcast around contrarian ideas, you build an audience of contrarians and that becomes a new consensus, as most people look for evidence that confirms what we already believe, and the entire model of the big tech platforms is to serve that up to us. On topics of this importance, I believe we have to challenge our thinking. I read the comments. I know that Rebel Wisdom, like any YouTube channel in this heterodox space, has a mix of viewers between the genuine first principles thinkers the reactionary contrarians, and people hero-worshipping their favourite YouTubers. And this film may be the breaking point between them, but it's probably about time. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I wanted to say, just because I think um, that people don't quite get it, it's still a part, a part about the warping factor of these 
platforms. Like we've obviously built a platform around certain um, films, uh, coverage of certain figures, interviews with certain figures. And with that comes, you, you build, and this is part of my, my critique of, of, of Brett and Heather, is that you build a new ecosystem. You may start off by being the heterodox or the counterpoint, but you build an ecosystem around that, that's the new consensus. Mm -hmm. And so I get, you see a lot in the comments, like oh, rebel wisdom, you might as well call it conventional wisdom. It's like, the point is that we're trying, like we're willing to challenge our own audience. Mm -hmm. Like, and pe people on the right are just as liable to get triggered as people on the left. Like oh, yeah. the, the, this is the, the thing I find quite amusing is sort of like uh, snowflakes everywhere. It's like, yeah, I mean, like you. Um, and that, that always kind of amuses me when you see people kind of losing their shit in the comments and you're just like, yeah, well, you're, you're just hijacked. You're hijacked by um, things that you're not even aware of and then projecting it all onto everyone else. Oh, you're there, the snowflakes over there. It's like, no, no, we, we, need, we need to become much more self-aware of our own biases, of our own kind of how we get captured, how we get taken over, because um, that is the only way. Like, that's what rebel wisdom is about is how do you become aware of those how do you start overcoming them how do you get to better sense making and which means exposing yourself to things you disagree with because if you can't do that then there's plenty of other youtube channels that will just tell you stuff that you agree with go and watch those sam harris's podcast with eric topol provoked quite a negative reaction i think it didn't hit the mark because firstly it wasn't detailed enough to address the science and his guest also used quite emotive language, like suggesting Brett's guests were predators. To posit that people who get a headache is having mRNA going into the brain, that is totally irresponsible. Mm. It's reckless, it, it's sick, and it, and it casts unnecessary doubts to these people, the innocent. You know, it's, it, it, in a way, Sam, I have to say it's predatory. Okay. So I'm going to take a small dip into the evidence and claims on the Dark Horse podcast and also in Brett and Heather's recent Substack article, which is their response to the Quillette piece and the Sam Harris podcast, and explain why I find some of their claims so worrying. Again, there's way more in the Medium document, which I'll correct and update as needed. And also, I will say, if there are better steel man versions of some of the claims being made and more credible concerns, I would like to hear them. I think I've shown with the Ivermectin film that I'm willing to risk the consequences from YouTube by publishing content that I believe is essential and truthful. But many of the arguments made by Brett and his guests just don't add up for me. Just a couple of examples. Firstly, there have been widespread fertility concerns about the vaccines, partially fueled by Brett's podcast with Steve Kirsch and Robert Malone. Oh, you See, don't think yeah. it's possible, right? right? So when a doctor sees a, a miscarriage, and says, I've never seen a, a baby like this in my entire career where it's so bloody and the brain is split in half and so forth. They argued that the spike protein from the vaccines concentrates in the ovaries. And then concentrations are rising conspicuously in two places as we close in on 48 hours. One of them is in the ovaries where it goes sky high. That's really frightening. Anybody that's looked at this data says, what? Yeah, that is a, <laughs> that is a very yes, frightening and, signal. And, 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 and it's the, the cognitive dissonance between what the CDC says is that this is safe for pregnant women. Right. This is perfectly safe. And it's on the CDC website. It's unbelievable. It's at some level, it's not safe for women at all. I mean, this is this is Right. This is right. So, right. so let's, it's not let's just pregnant just, women. Let's, let's, before we, before we interpret right. the data, let's right. make sure your listeners understand it. Okay, so the ovaries show a high concentration. For whatever reason, it's ending up in the ovaries. This is the graph they showed on screen for about 10 minutes, showing a massive spike in the ovaries, and it's just not true. Firstly, it was missing off the injection site, which was far higher, and many of the other organs have much higher concentrations of the vaccine than the ovaries. The claim that got Joe Rogan into trouble the other day, that the vaccines could themselves create dangerous variants, is a version of a claim that was made on the dark horse by Geert van den Bosch. He argued that we should stop vaccinating in a pandemic because high case numbers and lots of vaccinated people creates evolutionary pressure to create variants, that would then escape the vaccines. The very 
sort of environment that we're creating by having so many people vaccinated with a vaccine that doesn't kill off right. the virus. It actually can lead to more potent viruses. Try finding that story anywhere. So there's two versions of this argument, a more mainstream one and the more extreme one made by Gert van den Bosch. And Joe's wrong that this isn't being reported. Just before the UK opened up from lockdown, there was a letter from over 100 scientists that got quite a lot of publicity, warning that high case numbers in a highly vaccinated country was a recipe for disaster. But the counter argument to Van den Bosch saying we should stop vaccinating and the consensus view is that actually it's the high case numbers that are the problem because they provide more opportunity for mutations. And so the solution is to vaccinate more. In Brett and Heather's latest Substack piece, they double down on Van den Bosch's argument and make the extraordinary claim that the existing variants that we have, like Alpha, which came from the UK, and the Delta variant that came from India and is now dominant everywhere, were actually created by vaccine trials in these countries. Now, this is an amazing claim in many ways. Firstly, if it was true that these variants that are now ravaging the world were created by vaccine trials, then this should be front page news everywhere. But they provide zero evidence for that claim. And on the face of it, it's incredibly unlikely because even if Van den Bosch's argument is true, it's a numbers game. The more cases, the more vaccinated people, the more chance of mutations creating a more dangerous variant. To argue that that was more likely to have happened through small vaccine trials is peculiar. It's infinitely more likely that the Delta variant, for example, happened simply because of the huge case numbers in India. Because if it was this easy to create variants, that even these tiny vaccine trials created them, then right now we'd be seeing variants exploding everywhere. And the UK, which has one of the most highly vaccinated populations with high case numbers, would be ground zero. And the UK would pick it up because the UK has the biggest and best sequencing program in the world. The other claim that I wanted to touch on is that ivermectin is 100% effective in stopping you getting COVID, as that obviously has serious consequences if you decide to take it instead of getting vaccinated. Shocking as this will be to some people, the data suggests that prophylactic ivermectin is something like 100% effective at preventing people from contracting COVID when taken properly. Like I say, that I haven't made up my mind on like ivermectin you mentioned before, I, I think there's some, there's some signal there. There's an argument over how strong that signal is. Um, I think the, the argument that it works as a prophylactic is a much more consequential one than saying it works as a treatment. Like if the, You can argue over the, the quality of the data, but if I got COVID tomorrow, would I want to have some ivermectin? Maybe, uh, um, quite possibly. Like it, There's some evidence that it works. But Telling people it's kind of nearly 100% effective in stopping you getting COVID based on one, that particular 100% claim is based on one study. And that study is very, very shady. Like there's been a lot of, um, it's now been kind of uncovered that there's a lot of things about that study that are very, um, don't really add up. Like the data looks manipulated or imp well, impossible values in the data. Um, and that, is that's that's really troubling for me like I, I think we don't have a code of ethics in the alternative media space to cover this sort of stuff mm. um but if you're not talking to anyone who disagrees with you which i'm not seeing brett doing it, this is I, I i can't keep quiet about that and not speak out like that's real and that's it's about the sense making. It's about the sense making. It's also, as you know from the article, it's about how I don't. I and I want to say again, like I, I'm, I believe both Brett and Heather to be very ethical actors, but I also think we're in an information landscape where things get warped around us, where, we, where echo chambers get created, where you get audiences that want a certain thing, and we all can lose our ground. We can all lose our footing in this environment. I'm not a scientist. I'm trained as a journalist to assess different sources of information. So I take note of things in context and I try to understand people's motivations. Like, why is there so much evangelical certainty from the ivermectin advocates? This isn't science. Now, ivermectin may still be proved to work well against COVID, 
but the argument was that it was overwhelmingly proven beyond doubt and was being deliberately suppressed. There's a drug, it has positive effects. Why am I not seeing it discussed more? And then as I went deeper into the evidence and as you all generated more evidence and put it into the world and as the natural experiments that are in the world revealed themselves and showed the very same pattern, it became clear that this was actually taken in the aggregate. The amount of evidence is incredible, right? This is a very clear signal. It'd be hard to miss it unless that was your purpose, unless you had some confusion or reason not to want to know. But the point isn't just about the data on how well ivermectin works. It's the narrative that goes with it. Ivermectin has always been a proxy for different ways of understanding how the world works. Its advocates argued that the evidence was overwhelming and was being deliberately suppressed, that anyone who looked at it objectively would be persuaded, versus much of the medical establishment that said the evidence looks poor and they wouldn't recommend any other drug based on it. So this landscape has been changing in real time in just the last few weeks that I've been following it. And I think the advocate's argument is now proved to be wrong. Many of the studies have been withdrawn, new, bigger and better studies are coming in that show little benefit, and new meta-analyses coming from the Cochrane collaboration and others. And the ivermectin narrative has always been mainly fueled by people like Pierre Corey and Tess Laurie, who long ago made the shift from doctors or scientists to being campaigners. Again, totally within their rights to do that. They're good people trying to save lives. But should they be also relied upon as unbiased analysts of the data? Another scientist, Andrew Hill from the University of Liverpool, who had a meta-study in favour of ivermectin, has now retracted it, waiting for better data. The size of the conspiracy required by the ivermectin advocates to explain why the evidence keeps stacking up against them keeps getting bigger and bigger. And paranoid thinking becomes a trap. You can find any reason to suspect that any new piece of evidence is part of the conspiracy. It's a form of epistemic closure, which is why Pierre Corey tweeted this at Andrew Hill when he changed his mind on the evidence. Andy, stop. Seriously, you're causing untold deaths, man. For another WHO paycheck in the future? What the fuck? Me and Tess have both blown up our careers because history demanded it. Your fake cautiousness is the saddest shit I've ever seen. Fuck you. And that is putting it mildly. So I think Pierre Corey later deleted that tweet. And just in the last couple of days, it was revealed that Pierre Corey himself caught COVID last week, despite taking ivermectin. As I said, I haven't covered the COVID landscape in the same way that Brett and Heather have. And I wouldn't have covered it at all if it hadn't turned up on my doorstep but I have been tracking many of these claims and some of these medical figures for quite a long time, since the London Real investigation last May. The whole reason for covering this area, like I would not have gone anywhere near this topic if it had not been for Brett's decision to do that, my overlap with the Dark Horse audience, mm -hmm. the sense of this is now, these claims, these, this, that's the thing, Brett, a lot of these people were already out there in various, I was aware of Geert van den Bosch long before Brett had him on his podcast. He was on Dell Big Tree. I was aware of a lot of the, especially in May last year, there was a whole series of like medical grifters who turned up when I was covering the London Real story. Brian Rose, London Real, he launched this digital freedom platform, which was a massive scam after YouTube took down his interview with David Icke. Um, it was a weaponization of the free speech argument that made me really upset, really angry, because I think that's a sacred value, which is why I kind of went after him so hard. And it also flagged up some of these bigger issues. Um, and he, he basically kind of walked off with the money. And it made me really fucking angry that he did this. But also, I was, I was aware of a lot of these figures back then, a lot of the sort of people who've been kind of touting their chelation therapy or their kind of um, anti-vaccine or whatever their particular thing was and there are whether or not there is signal there there's a whole ecosystem like there are there are conferences dedicated to anti-vaccine movements there are whole incentive structures on that side and that's part of the problem that I have with people who are skeptical of the mainstream narrative but credulous of the other narrative it's like look there are incentive structures on both sides if you look carefully course, and yes. keep keep skeptical mm -hmm. um, so I was aware of all these people I was aware of these arguments I was aware of these figures um, and so 
yeah, I guess that's the, the, the key for me is, and I say this in the article, it's like that last 10%. Like I agree with Brett and Heather on so many of the pieces, they the points they make about kind of institutional capture and the warping factors of big pharma and all of these sort of issues. Yes. And ironically, I think most medical figures I know also like this is not forbidden knowledge. Like this is actually quite quite kind of well known. Um most medical figures I know know that. Like they know the corrupting effects of big pharma. This is not something unusual that that um hasn't been factored in by an awful lot of people. And so this this sense of it's the last 10%. It's not about the 90% of the warping factors. It's the last 10% of does the spike protein concentrate in your ovaries? Does Is ivermectin 100% effective as a prophylactic? Or can we say with confidence it's 100% effective as a prophylactic? The answer to those questions is no. Um, and that then there's a, there are consequences for everybody of saying that they're true. Yeah. Yes, the answers to those questions are independent of how much faith you have in the WHO or whether people did U-turns on masks or whether they were hypocritical in not condemning the Black Lives Matter protests but con condemning anti-masking protests. Um, all of those questions about the terms of the debate and... Um, people's personal political views and motivations are irrelevant to these questions. Yeah. These, these questions can be investigated and the evidence, the evidence for Brett and Heather's views on this seems to me to be very thin. As I said, you can read the accompanying documents and decide how thin that evidence is for yourself. I may be wrong and if I am, I'll correct the record. As you'll see from the Aereo article, we can all get lost in the uncanny valley of truth-seeking. We're all affected by the audience we attract and the way that we're funded. Rebel Wisdom is a business too, of course. We're funded by our members and by our sense-making courses, which gives me the freedom to pursue truth as best as I can. The biggest issue that the pandemic has laid bare is that our whole operating system of centralization is not fit for purpose. A centralized system struggles to deal with a complex problem like a pandemic. Dave Snowden's Kinefin framework explains this. So a complicated system is something like a jumbo jet or a computer. It's complicated, but we can map out precisely how it works. A complex system is completely different. It can't be mapped because all the different pieces are interrelated and changing one part changes others. Society is a complex system. Our bodies are complex systems in many ways. The pandemic is a complex problem, but our authorities respond to it as if it's just complicated, with one-size-fits-all singular solutions. But if you think about it, what's happening is every layer um, of the hierarchy has to compress the information. You know, if you were out in the field seeing what's going on with, say, the rainforest insects, and you're reporting it up to somebody who's at a think tank, who's reporting it up to a policymaker, who's reporting it up to a legislative decision maker, they're having to simplify a lot to go up the chain, right? So you're losing an enormous amount of information, which means that you can only do so much. It's kind of like if you imagine, uh, remember those like in the 80s, they had those glass spheres that if you touch them, lightning bolts will touch your fingers. So the sphere is the whole thing. And the broadcast modality is one of those lightning bolts. So it kind of like maneuvers around the sphere, but it can only handle that much. And that's not a lot. And that's just the nature of the structure. Right? Just this, a structure that has that kind of geometry to it can only perceive a certain fraction from the bottom to the top. And then, by the way, the same thing happens the other way down. The directives that are given from the top have to be, they, they have to be relatively simple because as they go down, there's a, an expansion of scope which increasingly adds basically noise because the, the person down below has to add a whole bunch of specificity to what to be done and then as it gets handed down, you get more and more noise. Um, and so the, this means at the top, the directives that come down have to be very broad and simple and at the bottom, the divergence between what actually happens out in the world and what was intended in the top is actually quite large. And so you've got a, a lack of elegance and precision and you get a compression going up. And so this means that it has certain capacities. It can actually get us to the moon. Turns out that's a domain that's well within the scope of what it can do. It cannot solve climate, full stop, period. Um, and there's a lot of other things it can't solve. So that's one boundary condition. And the pandemic was both a stress test and a dress rehearsal 
We need to learn the lessons and to upgrade our systems to deal with complexity, and that includes sense making above all. This has been a hell of a process. I've tried to do the best that I can, and others will judge how well that is. This may be the last film on this topic. As I said, sense making is the focus, not vaccines and ivermectin. Because even when this pandemic is over, the crisis of truth will remain. So the next films will continue to wrestle with that deeper problem. How can we find truth together? Because if we can't, and everything continues to fragment, then the chaos of the pandemic will be just a taste of what's to come. Thanks for watching, and see you soon. And if you want to join our conversations about topics like this in our digital campfire, then maybe consider joining as a member. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger. Diane Mushow Hamilton, John Viveki, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>